So um, I'll see what we can cover. So this is a quite a difficult talk to give to a because um, I know nothing about the audience. Um, we'll go through that in a second, but. Um, unfortunately, to cover the Python things, we have to cover a lot of theory first. Um, I'll try and keep that light and interesting, but um, prepare for a little bit of not Python to start with, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, please contact me afterwards, in particular if you have feedback or, or ideas or suggestions on how to improve this talk. Um, how did I get interested in radio? Does anyone recognize this skit from Sesame Street? I think this is probably almost as old as I am, but um, the, the, the Martians discovering the radio I always makes, makes me laugh. But um, So a question for the group. Who here has done some sort of radio stuff before? Maybe has a ham license or um, uh, has played around with an SDR or something like that? Cool. Um, who can characterize a low-pass filter from its poles and zeros in the Laplace domain? OK, that's really good, because if that was all yes, we'd all just go and have lunch or something. So, um, Who... <coughs> can do a Fourier transform. All of you, your ears do this all the time. Um, but we're going to talk about this. And who drove here today? Nobody. Oh, tell me where you parked later. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, OK, I don't have a ham radio license. We're not going to be doing anything like transmitting on the ham radio bands. Um, I can show you how to receive ham radio data. But importantly, a big part of radio is, is the rules of radio, licensing and spectrum and things like that. Um, I highly recommend the ham radio program. Um, I've actually read most of the books and, and I'm preparing to do the exam. It is a tremendous way to learn the theory of radio. Even if your plan is to do digital transmissions, Internet of Things kind of thing, the ham radio pro um, licensing program is really, really interesting and some of the best resources I've seen on this. Okay, so this talk is about SDR, software defined radio. Um, what is a software defined radio? Unfortunately, we're going to have to Go a bit deeper first. What is radio? But that's actually a bit tricky too. What is data? Um, we'll start from negative one and we'll work our way up. So in electronics, um, we're familiar with transmitting data between devices. We have serial links and um, headphone cables and speaker cables and HDMI cables. And the way they work fundamentally is we set a voltage at one end and we receive that voltage at another end. Um, this is a big hand wave here and there'll be a lot of hand waving in this talk, but we can drive, drive one end, read the other end. And if we have a digital protocol, we just come up with a, a standard. We agree on both ends what our, what our system is going to be. And so, for example, we might say a 1 is 3.3 volts and a 0 is 0 volts. And then we do clever things so that the other end can synchronize and, and pick up on the signal and know when I'm transmitting a byte, when I'm not transmitting a byte, and things like that. So whether you've used it directly or not, but if anyone's used like the UART on a, on a, um, a microcontroller or something like that, that is a serial protocol that involves setting high and low voltages. There's start bits and stop bits for synchronization. But ultimately, we're transmitting bits by high voltage and low voltage. Um, SPI and I2C are just an extension on these same ideas. And that's what it looks like on an oscilloscope. If you put a trace on a serial data line, um, either somewhere on your board or on a cable between your two boards or something like that, you have highs and lows corresponding to ones and zeros. And so what you see going on here is on the very left of the screen is the, um, the rest after the previous byte. We then toggle to low for a start, and then we start the first byte is a one. The first bit, sorry, is a one, then a bunch of zeros, and then a couple of ones, and then a zero. And then we go back up to resting again. Um, the bits are in the wrong order, but in the reverse order. But this is 6-1 um, in hex, which is the letter A. So that's what A looks like on the wire. And this works really well. Um, fundamentally, most of board-to-board -board communication is built on things like this. Um, and we call this baseband signaling. We're transmitting at the same frequency as the underlying data that we're, we're, tra we're transmitting. Um, so why can't I just do this and transmit gigabit down my Telstra phone line? Um, unfortunately, cables don't really work the way we hope they work. We can't transmit pulse voltage pulses and expect to see those same voltage pulses at the other end. Um, and there are real, real, real electronics comes into this. So this is a talk about radio, and one of the one of the, the main things we're going to one of the main tools we're going to use is a thing called uh, GNU Radio. Um, it's a C++ program that has an incredible set of Python bindings on top, and in particular has a very nice, easy to use, relatively easy to use flowchart tool that writes Python for us to to generate radio sketches. Now before we get into actually playing with the radio. One of the amazing things that GNU Radio can do is explore these fundamental concepts of um, signaling. So 
GNU Radio involves building flow diagrams where, where parts of our circuit flow into the next one and we connect them up. Um, our engine here means we're transmitting a series of floating point numbers between stages and things like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate a serial data transmission by, by taking a noise source and thresholding it. This will give us ones and zeros on the wire. And then I'm going to show what that looks like. I'm going to low pass filter it, but this is a simulation of our not perfect wire and I'm going to receive it at the other end. Um, so when I run this, what I see is that our beautiful signal that had nice square edges and stuff got distorted into a not beautiful signal. And the more and more that our wire distorts the signal, the worse that gets. Until at some point, it's barely recognizable at all. Now, we can get into a bunch of the, 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 the maths here. But there are limits about and characterizations and what and what limits you can transmit at. But for a given wire, there'll be some maximum limit that, 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 that you can reliably get data through it. So this is a great tool for playing around with this stuff. Um, when I was in university, we learned this by the theory, lots of maths and formulas. But visualizing this and looking at what the shape of the waveforms look like gives you a great idea of, of how these systems perform. And we're going to do a lot of that. So what's really going on here is wires don't like to be changed. The voltage, the, it resists the change of voltage. Fundamentally, what we need to understand is that um, if we think instead of, instead of um, voltage changing, we're transmitting um, oscillations through this wire. Um, an oscillation is represented as a sine wave. So from, from um, maths, we have um, a function over time is a sine wave of time with some frequency, some amplitude, and some phase offset. Um, so the frequency is how fast that sine wave oscillates, the amplitude is how big that sine wave is, and the phase is how much we shift it left and right relative to, to zero. And this is the, the most interesting thing that we're going to cover in this talk. If you walk away from this talk with nothing else, and you didn't know this already, that any signal in the time domain can be expressed instead as a linear sum of sine waves. So if I take any arbitrary shape, I can give you an equivalent set of sine waves that add together to that shape. This is, the, this is the fundamental part of like Understanding this is key to understanding radio. And here's an example of a square wave that's actually made of sine waves. So if I start with a low frequency sine wave and keep adding more and more sine waves to it, what I actually end up with is a square wave. And so you can imagine your digital signal actually being composed of sine waves. Why do we, why do we care about these sine waves? We'll see that in a minute. But this is a beautiful diagram of, of how these sine waves actually add together. Um, I'll, I'll share the links, or you can look at the links later and stare at this diagram until you see what's really going on here. But um, as they line up in phase, you get these transitions. Now, notice this is not a perfect square wave. It's kind of like our noisy one that we saw on the wire earlier. Um, but if we add an infinite series of sine waves, we will get our original square wave. And that's the key point. We need an infinite number of square waves to perfectly represent a square wave. It's the sine waves to represent square wave. So here's a few more sine waves added to it, and you start to see we start to get a, a better and better signal. OK, so all we care about is signals, in whatever form they are, square waves, audio signals, or whatever, are fundamentally built out of sine waves. When we talk about the, how the electronics and the, and the signal processing works on our signals, we deal with the sine waves instead because it makes it easy to deal with the electronics. Fundamentally here, we're talking about oscillations of things, and all of these things have solutions that involve differential equations, and sine waves and exponentials have interesting properties as far as that goes. So the Fourier transform is our formalism of how we, how we deal with this time domain, frequency domain thing. So I can take a time signal and Fourier transform it into the frequency components, and vice versa. I can do the inverse Fourier transform to take frequency components back to time. Now we understand kind of how the reverse works. We add all the sine waves together and we get back our signal. That was what the example we showed earlier was. Um, you'll see this referred to as the fast Fourier transform, the FFT. This is because the algorithm we use is the, the fast version rather than the slow version. Um, cool maths that makes that work. Um, but yeah, people commonly refer to this as the FFT. So this is our square wave again. And what we're looking at now is the frequency version of this. So this square wave is the sum of all of those frequencies. It's symmetric around zero, so just sort of consider the right-hand edge of the right-hand half of this. But what we're seeing is that 
anywhere there's a pulse here corresponds to another sine wave component that's, that's a part of this signal. So the problem here is that in order to represent our pulse train, um, we needed an, a really wide range of frequencies to capture that, that signal. And if our wire were to cut off some of those frequencies, which is what this wire is doing, we start to get a, a poorer and poorer reproduction of the original signal. So this is kind of a, a very, very, very basic approximation of what a wire might do, is cut off high frequency components in the wire. So that's the point I was making earlier. Wires behave differently to different frequencies. This is a wire that cuts off the high frequencies. Um, okay. What's going on here? The electronics, the wire actually is a capacitor. Um, it resists the change. And capacitance, importantly, a formula for capacitance is a function of frequency. Higher frequencies resist the, the higher frequencies are attenuated more by our signaling. We're going to cover this more in a second, but sine waves can be expressed as both being at some position, but also some offset. Um, this will be a lot more important for the radio stuff later. But this is when we talk about phase. We're talking about two sine waves that have the same frequency, but a slightly different time offset. Um, it only matters up to um, 360 degrees, because after 360 degrees, you're now aligned exactly with where you started. The, the reason this is important is that when I want to capture the, the, the frequency and phase of a signal, rather than remembering the frequency and phase, so that would be C and phi, I can instead capture A and B. This is kind of Pythagorean theorem going on. The details here are not important, but when we talk about sampling the radio, we'll always be talking about an in-phase and a quadrature component. And what this is, is this A and B. And the reason we want this is that we might want our software radio to also understand the phase information. For our purposes at the moment, we can just kind of think of A and B together, uh, like a pair of samples, and together we can see um, what, the, what, the, what the, the voltage was at that point. Um, so each frequency component sees a different resistance. That's what we're saying. OK, so basic data transform stuff. Um, we signal with, with changing voltages. Um, digital signals are a problem for us because they have these really wide frequency spectrums. Um, signals can be con thought of as being made up of a sum of sine waves. Cables are awful. Um, and this may seem like a weird thing to talk about in the context of electronics and serial data. But we're used to this already with, uh, with audio. When you play a note on a piano, that is one frequency. You play two notes on a piano, and now you hear the combination of those frequencies. What's actually happening is you have two frequencies playing at once, but you, we hear the sum of them. Our ear turns that back into two different frequencies, and we, and we hear a note, a chord in this case. OK. So the second miracle of electronics, after the Fourier versus uh, the inverse, um, the time for frequency relationship, is that if you take this changing voltage signal and you put it into an antenna, so I have an antenna, at the bottom of it I change its voltage, it propagates through free space. It's, and then if I have an antenna of similar properties at the other end, that voltage appears on that antenna. It really is that simple. Drive a voltage here, see a voltage here. Okay, it's not really that simple, but like the, the basics are, if I have an analog circuit driving a voltage, I can record a voltage on another antenna and see the same signal. However, it's like a wire but worse. It only transmits a specific band of frequencies. So rather than being zero to something, it's something to something plus n. And so I might have a, a, pair, of radio, a pair of antennas that transmit FM radio music. And so they only transmit in the range of approximately 100 megahertz, and the receiving end can only receive it in approximately 100 megahertz. But if I drive this end with a, with, a, with a range of frequencies around 100 megahertz, I will see a signal at that end that contains these 100 megahertz components. So yeah, it's a cable, it's a cable that instead of passing low frequencies only, it passes a band of frequencies. And depending on which frequency we choose, we have totally different properties. Um, so, and incredibly, the same thing applies to light. So in theory, if I were to drive that frequency at a really, really high frequency, I would be producing light. It doesn't really work like that, but um, the same spectrum of varying voltages um, causes our entire electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you've probably heard of some of these VHF. So this is things like um, marine radio and um, TV, and, and uh, old analog TV was VHF and UHF. Um, 
and things like uh, the microwave, for example. Turns out when you when you make radio waves at two point approximately two point four gigahertz, it heats water, um, and um, that's a part of our electromagnetic spectrum as well. So now what we've got as a problem is, is we've got this signal that we want to transmit, but we need to be, be mindful not just of how wide the bandwidth of the signal is, so the, the frequency components that are involved, but also where in the spectrum those frequency components are. So if I want to transmit a signal at 100 megahertz, but my underlying data rate is only 200 kilobits or something like that, I need to make sure that my spectrum produces frequency components in the 100 megahertz range. Um, so Bluetooth is a great example. Now Bluetooth is, turns out is, is that exact same 2.4 gigahertz that I just mentioned about microwaves. When they came to dividing up the spectrum, they were like, oh wow, we already have these super noisy microwave things. We can't possibly use this space for anything else. And then when they needed a place for people to put their personal devices that wasn't licensed, they're like, oh well, this microwave spot is free. And so it turns out also 5 gigahertz is, is double that. So it's also the harmonics of microwaves and things like that. Um, this is a legal requirement. I can't just transmit at any frequency I like, even though I'd want to, because the, the frequency has the particular properties that I would like. Um, there, is, there is a licensing system going on here. Um, there are a bunch of ranges that, that, that you can use for different purposes. There are rules attached to these things, like you have to do a particular uh, limit on power, or you have to use um, some sort of frequency hopping technique or something like that. Um, and different areas have different rules. So for example, marine radio, um, anyone can go and get a marine radio license after they sit an exam, but like not anyone can go and get a, a license to transmit in the mobile phone ranges, for example. Okay, so how do we take our signal that was some sort of set of frequency components and specifically choose the frequency spectrum that we want so that it transmits over the radio? And the answer is a thing called modulation. So modulation takes our signal and transforms what the frequency domain looks like while maintaining the underlying signal. And it's a reversible transform, so I can convert it back to my underlying data. And there's a bunch of properties. Remember with those sine waves we talked about earlier? We can modulate any of the parameters of those sine waves. So um, the simplest example of radio modulation is AM. What I do is I take the signal I want to transmit, which is a varying voltage over time, and I use that to change the strength of my radio transmission. And so at the other end, I record how strongly I'm receiving your radio signal, and that's the, that's the voltage that the other end was transmitting. And as long as that's rel relatively slow, it's actually quite an effective way to do it. It works for AM radio. Um, um, on top of that, we have a bunch of really clever digital schemes as well, things like CDMA and DSS, that allow us to build on top of these to build really wide um, spectrum and low noise and a very high noise tolerance. So GPS signals, for example, um, are so faint, you know, they're coming from satellites and we're receiving them on these tiny antennas, um, that you need really, really clever processing techniques to be able to recover any signal from the noise. Um, we won't go into the details of these, but. So a signal, a, a particular frequency in our spectrum is a sine wave. Um, we modulate some of these parameters and sometimes we modulate more than one parameter at once. Um, so QAM is an example and QAM powers things like ADSL modems and, um, and Wi-Fi and things like that. Um, so the cool trick about amplitude modulation is that what I'm doing is I'm modulating some high frequency thing. So if I want to transmit a signal at one megahertz, but, my, but I have like a little 200 um, bit per second thing I'm transmitting, what I do is I, I multiply the two things together. So when I want to transmit a one, I transmit my one megahertz signal over the radio. When I want to transmit a zero, I just don't transmit anything at all. So the other end says, I'm receiving a signal, that's a one. I'm not receiving a signal, that's a zero. Now what really happens here is I just multiply the two things together. On or off times a signal gives us a signal that turns on or off. Um, the audio case would be I multiply by the strength of my audio, the, the amplitude of my audio signal at any point in time. Now what really happens here mathematically is that multiplying two signals multiplies the, um, uh, in the time domain is the equivalent of adding their frequency components. This is an important identity that helps you understand a lot of the radio stuff, but the important thing is two, two cosine waves, two sine waves multiplied together produce new sine waves that are the sum and difference of the frequencies. Um, so what this means is that I can take a signal that contains frequency components, multiply it by a sine wave of a, of a chosen frequency, and the entire spectrum moves up 
to the sum of those two frequencies. So if I want to take my 200, kilo, my 200 bit per second serial data and transmit it at, one, at 100 megahertz, all I have to do is multiply it by a 100 megahertz signal. And we'll give a demo of this uh, in a second. Frequency phase modulation change other properties, um, which we'll give a demo of as well. Now, a real radio does all this in hardware. Electronic components make all this work. And they have hardware mixers, those multipliers, oscillators to generate the right frequencies, um, filtering and stuff like that. And so when I buy an FM radio receiver, it has electronics in it that tunes to a particular channel and only receives analog audio at FM. It can't do anything else. Similarly, you might have a hardware um, Bluetooth radio or something like that, and, and, and the output of it is, is, is bytes, not, not this is the underlying radio data. Um, this is why software radio is important. Um, cool. So antennas give us a channel, but it's an annoying channel that we have to transmit at a specific frequency. Um, we use the, the different parts of the spectrum to um, uh, give us different radio properties. It's things like lower frequencies travel a lot further. Um, high frequencies allow us to do things like they, they don't travel as far. So for Wi-Fi, that's a great property. I don't want my Wi-Fi signal to be received by someone at the other end of the street. Um, we use modulation to change the properties of our signal so that it fits the properties of the spectrum. Um, radio hardware is, is a, for a dedicated purpose, usually. Um, and this mixer property, which is that multiplying two signals together can allow us to shift up and down the frequency spectrum. Cool, what's a software radio? I take all those things I said about hardware and I make them software instead. So all I do instead is that that voltage on the antenna that I receive I convert it to digital as soon as possible with an analog to digital converter, and then do everything else in software. Fourier transform in software, oscillator, mixer, um, pass, low, low and high pass filters, all just algorithms now. Um, more importantly, it means that these algorithms are configurable, and I can do, do things in software that I can't do in hardware. I can write really good filters um, that have very good performance characteristics. Um, but it, the problem we have here is I can't just sample um, a radio signal that's going at 2.4 gigahertz, because I would need to sample that at 5 gigahertz. We'll talk about why that is in a second. Um, so what the software radios tend to do is they have a mixer in the hardware, shifts it down to a frequency range that we want to work with, and then they sample that at a reasonable rate. A reasonable rate. So for example, the radio we're going to work with today shifts everything down into a 20 megahertz wide band um, using a mixer, and then we just sample at 20 megahertz instead. So sampling, what is this sampling thing I keep talking about? So the radio spectrum and, and electronics in general is an analog thing. I change a voltage and the voltage changes continuously over time. When I convert this into software, I need to deal with this as a series of recordings. So what was the voltage now? And then T plus one, T plus two, how does that voltage change? So I have some finite number of samples of my signal over time. Um, and these are, these are amplitude over time. Now, I mentioned earlier, there are actually two recordings per sample in phase and quadrature. If I'm going to capture a signal, I need to sample it at least twice as fast as the highest frequency component that can, that's contained in it. If we think about this in terms of a, a square wave, pulse train, if I sample slower than the rate of the pulses, I won't see every pulse. So I have to sample at least, as twi at least twice as fast as the, as the rate of pulses so that I make sure I capture every up and every down in that signal. Um, if I'm talking about audio, if my audio signal contains like a very high pitched note or something like that, I will only capture that if I'm sampling at least twice the frequency of that note. So we'll see this when we talk about receiving radio data, because I ne I'll need to know how wide the spectrum is of the thing I'm transmitting and sample at least twice as fast as that. This is why CD audio you might have seen is 16-bit is, is, um, at 44,100 samples per second. The reason for this is that our hearing goes from roughly 0 to 20,000 hertz. So 44,100 is, is double that. 44,100 is an interesting number because it's got a bunch of other properties, but effectively it's twice 20. Um, this is the same as the slide from before. We can think of um, a sine wave with a phase offset on the right as being actually two sine waves at, at 90 degrees out of phase. When we sample on the radio, don't need to understand this in, in a huge amount of detail, but when we sample on the radio, what we receive is a stream of complex numbers. And remember, a complex number can be just thought of as a pair of numbers. Um, or, mathematically, it's an uh, amplitude and an angle. 
And that's exactly what it is here. It's the amplitude of the sine wave and the phase angle of that sine wave. So our, so our software radio is a device that samples an antenna and converts that into a stream of bytes. And now we're in software land. We don't have to worry about any of the, the, the details of, of, of how the hardware works. Um, we have a stream of bytes. And that's what, that's what the people, in, in, people like me, not electrical people, um, can, can deal with. I can write algorithms. I can write for loops and things like that. So there's a bunch of approaches now. I can literally treat this as a stream of bytes and do, do whatever I like. I can use a SciPy or something like that and, and um, NumPy and a lot of people use MATLAB or, or Octave and things like that. Um, but building all these things that I want to do, it turns out the algorithms I'm going to implement are things like low-pass filters and uh, mixes and things like that. So I'm going to use libraries that, that build all these components up and I just sort of call them as APIs. So GNU Radio is a great example of this. Um, and then GNU Radio Companion is the tool that I was using earlier that allows us to build these um, radio software radio designs um, in a flow diagram. Software radio can also do transmit. So if I can equivalently generate these stream of samples, so in phase and quadrature pair samples at some data rate, the radio can transmit them as well. It does the exact process in reverse and produces a radio signal instead. So software radio is about taking all of those hardware things and turning them into software problems. Um, most importantly, in the bottom right-hand corner, they're configurable. I can write code, DSP code and things like that that run on a microcontroller that sits right next to the radio front end. Oh my goodness. Um, and um, yeah. Okay, so the HackRF. This is an example of a software radio. It's kind of a mid-range software radio. Um, it can only uh, transmit or receive at once, um, but it can transmit and receive. It can sample anything from one meg to six gig, um, and it can sync two hacker. You can sync multiple hacker apps together. So you can use this for things like radio astronomy and interferometry and stuff like that as well. It has excellent support from its developer and open source hardware, open source software. Um, it was in the news a few weeks ago. Um, it turns out. Lots of things use radio. And just like Internet of Things devices, radio devices are not very well secured. Um, you have to wear a hoodie when you hack things with your hacker. <laughs> um, a great quote from the creator of the hacker, which is that maybe they should use the hacker to debug and test their security. But um, yeah. OK, I'm going to race through this very quickly. but. I can build a more sophisticated flowchart with GNU Radio. Um, sorry, Radio Waterfall. And this will take our radio source, rather than like a random source I used earlier, and show me the, f the Fourier transform, and show me the Fourier transform over time. So if I run this, so the radio in the bottom left-hand corner here is tuned to 100 megahertz. And so what we're seeing is how much spectra, how much um, Amplitude at any given frequency is there in this spectrum. So we see this big spike at zero, that's the DC offset of the antenna, but these faint lines are FM radio stations near us. I could tune the radio to that station, do FM demodulation on that, and get music. Can't do that in here because the, the, the signal strength is not strong enough, but this flowchart is kind of considered to be you know, the example hello world of, of GNU radio. I record from the radio, I filter it down to just the, the, the 200 kilohertz bandwidth of an FM radio station. GNU Radio has a FM receive block that converts it into audio samples, and I can play it out through my speakers. Um, imagine I did this, and you got the radio. You all know what the radio sounds like. But um, um, there's a bunch of tools as well that are built on top of this, and Python tools as well that are built on top of this. They let you visually drag, your, drag around the spectrum and select a range, and it just plays automatically. Equivalently, I could be doing something like um, ADSB or something like that, and there's a program called Dump 1090, which takes that stream and turn, converts it into the coordinates of airplanes and things like that. Um, I'm going to do a very quick demo. What I've brought is a little buggy that we use for teaching electronics. So it's a um, motors, wheels, LEDs. Um, I'm going to turn it on and it's locked. It's um, a car. And then on top of that, I have a beeper for my car. 
that I can use to lock and unlock my car. So when I press one button, the car unlocks, and the other button, the car locks. So I'm going to use my radio to look at what's going on there. Cool. So I record from the radio, and I write the data straight out to a file. So I just need to switch the antenna. So like I said earlier, the antenna drives the properties of the, of, uh, the properties of the antenna change what frequencies we can receive. So now we're talking like Bluetooth spectrum, 2.4 gig. So I'll put that there. So I'm going to run this. I'm going to lock my car, unlock my car, lock my car. And then I'm going to take my captured data and play it back out as a transmit on the radio. <laughs> Is that terrifying or what? Like, <laughs> so I haven't watched the video that they talk about in the, um, I, like this will work for a garage door remote. This will work for a lot of devices out there. Um, devices don't have replay text. So it turns out implementing re, uh, replay protection, because it turns out implementing this is a required state between the two devices. Um, I'm gonna, there's a very quick demo here that I wanna talk about the Python side of it. So what, what did we actually transmit there? Radio data at 2.4 gig. The, the micro bit that I'm using to do this has a, has a Bluetooth radio um, transceiver in it. And these are one megahertz channels in the 2.4 gig spectrum. So GNU radio is really great at doing the, the heavy duty software radio stuff. But ultimately what I want at the end is data. So um, when I run this, what I'm doing is looking at the spectrum and then doing quadrature demodulation on the radio data. So watch when I press the, the transmit button. I actually see ones and zeros. So that is me seeing the FM modulation of a Bluetooth data transmission on one particular Bluetooth channel. They're ones and zeros. That's exactly my serial data, but it is actually being encoded as the frequency deviation of a um, 2.4 gig radio carrier. So once I've captured that, I can pump that into um, a clock decoder. So this synchronizes to what the bit speed of that underlying data is. Um, tidy it up a bit, slice it up into bits, look for the preamble, the 101010 preamble that, radio, that Bluetooth signals have, and dump it out to a file. And then, um, uh, um, so I'm going to read from that FIFO that I'm writing to. Run that example that synchronizes the clock and listens to my radio data. And in my terminal, I see a bunch of my actual data transmissions. So if we look really closely, they all, that, those numbers will be the ASCII for lock and unlock, which is actually the string I'm transmitting. In a real car, it would be the car's ID or something like that. Um, I can very quickly show you what clock.py looks like. It's basically has to do a little bit of the data dewhitening, which is a radio property um, which you can talk about in the sprints or something. Um, but yeah, read bits, assemble them into bytes, play back the bytes. Um, that's how quadrature modulation works. Um, okay. <laughs> When I transmit data, I have to usually trans pre-transform the data as well. So that, for example, Bluetooth has this thing called a linear feedback shift register that takes long strings of ones and zeros and turns them into changing ones and zeros. So that way the signal can be clocked. Um, this is the, I looked up in the data sheet, this is what the format of the things look like. So when I decode the bits, I have to turn them back into bytes and data. Um, so a lot of time spent doing actual software stuff, not radio stuff, is understanding just the general data protocols and things like that. And then I can reassemble. That was the demo I just showed you. Um, the key thing here is GNU Radio does a lot of work for us. But at the end of the day, what GNU Radio is doing for us is writing Python. So when I ran that sketch earlier, it wrote this Python file for me. Um, and there's a lot of stuff about the GUI configuration and stuff like that. But once we get into the actual interesting part, uh, where are we? So it made a, a quadrature demodulator. 
um, later we'll see that we connect that to the constant offset. And so this is us building up a series of APIs. Yeah. Where does it run there? On the on the on the um, on my laptop. So over USB, I'm receiving this stream of 20 million samples per second. There are software radios where you can run this code on the software radio as well, which is really cool. Yeah. Okay. So what else can we do with radio? What do we learn? So this whole property of radio, which is that multiplying by a sine wave shifts the spectrum up and down the radio signal. So what if I transmit a signal and receive it on a different antenna and then multiply it by itself? By applying that maths, the result is I get the cosine of the, of the difference in phase. So if I transmit a signal to that wall, it bounces back and comes back at me. Depending on how far it was, there'll be a phase offset. So I can actually measure in multiples of the phase, or the multiples of the wavelength, I should say, how far away that wall is. But what if that wall is moving? Effectively, that phase is changing over time. So by looking at a reflected waveform and applying that maths, I realize I'm running through this quite fast, but the, walk, walk through the slides afterwards and, and, and step by step. Um, what I receive is a, a sine wave at a very low frequency that corresponds to exactly to how many wavelengths per second you're moving towards me. This is the Doppler effect. And what if I introduce a sawtooth into my transmission wave so I can tell what the frequency difference was over time between when I transmitted it and when I received? Now I know how fast something is moving and how far away it is based on that received signal. So I can make a signal but from the bottom left hand corner going around clockwise, 2.4 gig rate, um, generator, um, splitter, amplifier, uh, mixer, and then an amplifier. I can build a software radio front end, which is um, an amplifier and an anti-aliasing low pass filter. It can drink a lot of pineapple juice and put it into a, a Pi board. And in MicroPython, I can do sample from, I can do the analog to digital stuff. I can do a Fourier transform. Um, I can analyze the resulting data that I got back from all that. So what I've done is just done software radio with a little, like the same hardware front end of a software radio, but I'm doing the algorithm, which is effectively looking at the FFT and understanding what the frequency components of my response were, because I know that my response, I have to, I have to basically pull out the components of that bottom formula. I can move my hand backwards and forwards really quickly in front of it, and that's that sine wave. So just by analyzing the parameters of that sine wave, I can solve for the range and distance of a um, thing. I have a video here of someone standing on the other side of the room breathing. But OK, links. Sesame Street video. Um, GNU Radio. This is the best thing you can ever read about f understanding all the theory here. Um, I found this too late into my degree to have made a difference on my marks, but I wish I had found it earlier. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful free Download the PDF book. Um, Spectrum, um, ham radio, definitely worth checking out. Um, the Hack RF, this, a lot of links to the amp hour here. This guy, Michael Osman, who made the Hack RF, has produced some incredible training materials. Greatshotgadgets.com slash SDR, series of, I think, eight videos that explain this in a lot more detail and a lot better and slower. Um, and he's got this a demo from uh, DEF CON um, where he does DSSS on a hacker app to receive, I think, GPS data. Um, bunch of useful tools, um, other SDR hardware, so more features, and then the S RTL SDR is worth mentioning because it's only $20 but only does receive. Um, and then a bunch of different Python tools. So SOAPY SDR is a bunch of SDR libraries that have Python bindings. So this is the approach where I just want to write Python code of receive samples and compose the bits together. Um, Shiny SDI is a really interesting one. It runs a web server. So you can put your radio somewhere, run a web server on it, and then somewhere else do all the front end radio stuff over, over the network. Uh, GQRX is the interactive visualization tool I was talking about. A uh, bunch of interesting things about the radar. Look up a guy named Greg Shavart um, and all of those links, and you can read much more about the radar stuff. Thank you very much. I hope that was useful. Um, please come and see me. I'll be here on the sprint and around for the next couple of days. We'd love to go through this a lot slower in more detail. And if you had feedback, please let me know as well. But um, thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. I hope you're all paying attention. There'll be a test on uh, quadrature demodulation at the end of the day. Uh, look, we, we're pretty tight on timing now. Um, so I think it might be best to, uh, to thank Jim, uh, give him the mug of awesomeness um, that all speakers are going to be receiving today. So. Here we go.
And if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, uh, I'm sure uh, Jim's happy to sort of to hang around and answer them. Uh, morning tea's on now. Uh, we're coming back here at 10:45. Uh, if I could just ask, if um, all of the speakers who are speaking today, if you're here, if. Can